Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation of Integrative Behavioral Health. Today, we are talking about improving outcomes in learning and e-learning. I'm your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. Who is going to care about this presentation? Well, hopefully everybody. If you are a lifelong learner, we're going to talk about ways to make learning more efficient for you and hopefully more fun. But this presentation is also useful for teachers, clergy, counselors, health educators, anybody who interacts with any other person to try to help them learn something, gain knowledge. This also includes parents in daily life trying to teach their kids things, as well as helping their students adapt to e-learning. That's one of the biggest stressors that people have been talking about lately is helping their children actually learn something from e-learning. And it, this all can also be helpful for supervisors because obviously as supervisors, a lot of times we are trying to help our supervisees learn something. There are three C's of learning, capturing, conceptualizing, and caring. Uh, capturing means getting the information into your brain. And there are several different things we need to consider here. Uh, we have talked before uh, about different types of learning, auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. And these sometimes reflect people's uh, temperament preferences. You tend to find extroverts tend to be more auditory active learners and introverts tend to be more visual reflective learners. That's not always the case, but it does, you know, seem to hold most of the time. So let's talk about auditory. If you have a person who is not an auditory learner, and I'm not, you know, I will be the first to tell you that, I am very much a visual learner. So watching videos, listening to podcasts, those sorts of things, even sitting in lecture can be really challenging for me because I have a hard time taking in that information and processing it as efficiently. I'm also a reflective learner, which doesn't help at all. So... Auditory learners uh, do really well with videos, with lectures, with anything that they're listening to. My daughter's an auditory learner. She does great with lectures. She can watch a television show once, maybe twice, and pretty much know the entire dialogue. It's, you know, kind of insane the way she can do that. But <clears throat> recognizing your learning style is really important. Now, my daughter... Uh, also has dyslexia. So visual learning is very difficult for her. Um, she tends to be more of a active learner. Well, in between active and reflective. So with visual learners, if you are in a situation in which you're in a lecture it's in, or having to watch a video or listen to a podcast, it's important to make that information visual. Take notes if you can. Try to do things so you're seeing what is being said. If you're an auditory learner that's having to do a lot of reading, read it out loud, record it, so then you can listen to it. Those are two easy ways to do it on your own. Now, the third type of learning is kinesthetic, and that's learn by doing, learn by manipulation. And you can manipulate information, you can manipulate stuff without actually having to use your hands. You can manipulate what you're hearing by paraphrasing it or turning it into quiz questions or flashcards. Uh, there are a lot of different ways you can take the information and manipulate it. If you tend to be more artistic, you can even make graphs and charts and anything like that. Uh, kinesthetic learners do need to kind of do, though. So they often prefer things that are more active, more hands-on, more application. Active and reflective listeners, that's another dimension. So you're either auditory, visual, or kinesthetic primarily. you probably got um, some aspects of the other one. People are rarely just purely auditory learners, but you prefer one style. Active and reflective is when, kind of when you capture the information. Active learners take in 
information and they process it while they're going. They're people who do really well in auditory environments often because they can keep up with the instructor who is saying, you know, we're doing this, then of course the next step is this. Reflective learners need to take that information in, have a few minutes to process it, and then they have their aha moment. They have to synthesize it first, but they need time to reflect on it and make meaning out of it. So it is important to make sure that you are giving breaks periodically if you're working with reflective learners, if your student is a reflective learner making sure that they know that it's okay to take take a thinking break for a few minutes here and then you know so you can process the information and really get it instead of trying to for example read the entire chapter and hope that you retained everything visual reflective learners i tend to have read a page or a paragraph or a section and then take notes and try to summarize what it is that they got out of that section and do that section by section in order to give them a chance to reflect, digest, and get that information in their brain in order to move to the next steps. Capturing also involves attention. And attention can be fleeting for people at times. Number one, if they are in an environment in which they're not being presented with information in their preferred learning style. When I used to sit in lectures at the university, my mind would just be all over the place. I had a hard time sustaining attention unless I was actively taking notes to meet my visual learning needs. So it's important to attend to distractions. Make sure people are in a relatively distraction-free environment so they're not being pulled one direction or another. Encourage people to know what time of day they are more attentive. Most people have a time period where they are more energetic, more focused. I'm a morning person. I do really well from about 4.30 a.m. until about noon. And after noon, you know, that's when I do a lot of stuff that doesn't require intense concentration. My son, on the other hand, is more of an evening, more of a night owl, and he does his best work, you know, after about 1.30. Knowing your personal clock and your personal time of day is really important. Knowing the duration that you can focus is also important. Like I said, with the chapters, it is important not to, you know, take three hours and just cram information in and cram information in. Because at a certain point, you're not paying as much attention. You're having sort of diminishing returns from what you're actually learning. Chunking information can be helpful. Learn your particular duration. Can you focus for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour? At what point does your attention start kind of degrading? And that's how you know kind of how to best set your study times. If you are one of those people who can focus for hours on end, well, more power to you. But that's, those people are often few and far between. And make sure that people, if they have the ability to set a schedule, do one that's in a manner that is consistent with their with their preferences, with their personality. If they are judges, they are probably go going to want to have a schedule so they know every day at 2 p.m. from 2 to 4 is when I do my homework. Perceivers are not going to prefer to be that hemmed in. They're going to want to know that, okay, I've got to find two hours at some point today in order to do my studying. Either way is fine. It's identifying what works best for the individual. So once you've gotten the information into your brain, it's sitting there in that short-term memory, then you've got to conceptualize it. You've got to turn it into something that can be filed in your mental filing cabinets. Top down or bottom up is the first place we start. And that goes back to temperament again, sensing and intuitive. Top down people uh, start with the end product, the big concept, and then they break down 
and and try to figure out the the individual parts. Bottom up, they start with the details. And the best way I have ever found for helping people figure out if they're top down or bottom up is to ask them how they do puzzles. When I do a puzzle, I like to see the um see the box so I know what I'm looking at. And that is very much a top-down thing. I want to see what the finished product is so I see what I'm trying to create. Um, And then I put together the frame. You know, I get an outline, a container to hold it. So I clearly am starting from the top and then trying to figure out how all the pieces fit together. Bottom-up people often don't bother with the box. And they just, they start finding pieces and they're like, oh, this looks like part of a flower. Let me see if I can find other parts of a flower. And they start putting together objects in the puzzle, for example. And then they start trying to figure out how those objects fit together. And then finally, when it's put together, they realize what they were building on. Movies are the same way. TV shows. If you're one of those people that has to read the excerpt about the movie before you go in to watch it, you're probably a top-down person. Bottom-up people can turn on a television show, have no idea what it's about, and just be pleasantly surprised as it plays out. You know, I, I remember one day sitting in the movie theater with my kids. We went to see... Um, uh, bu- 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 Oh, the movie with all the little yellow creatures. Help help me with that one. Uh, Despicable Me. And I didn't know what it was about. And yes, it was a kid's movie. And yes, I was there for with my children, for my children. But I had to pull it up on my phone. I just couldn't not look at the description of what it was about. My husband gets mad at me because I'll go read wikis about uh, um, things shows that we're watching. And yes, there are some spoilers in it, but at least I understand, kind of have a big overview of what we're talking about. Intuitive um, people tend to be more top down. Sensing people tend to be more bottom up. And it's also important when you are um, conceptualizing information to take whatever you have and relate it to something that you know. Relate it to, you know, other movies that you've watched or relate it to experiences that you've had. That can always be helpful. When I was in developmental psych, I remember relating it to experiences that I had had when I was babysitting. And then we'll talk about it in a few minutes. But when I would go to the mall or to the grocery store, I would watch little children and I would think, okay, I wonder what stage of development they're in or, oh, that totally makes sense because they're clearly going through this phase. And it was, it was helpful for me to take that information and continually relate it to things that I was interacting with. And finally, caring. So you get the information in there in your short-term memory, you conceptualize it, you box it all up so you know where you might file it in your mental filing cabinets. And then caring basically comes down to, do I really want to make space in my mental filing cabinets for this information? Or is this something that I'm not going to need in two weeks? You know, some of the classes that you take in college, unfortunately, are probably information you may not need after the final exam. So you need to file it sort of in a midterm memory. But Uh, A lot of stuff we do want to remember. So we want to explore people's motivations for learning the material. If they are thinkers, you know, how is it logical that you learn this material? In what ways is this good that you know about how cells function or whatever? Uh, For people who are feelers, you want to help them understand how knowing this information can help them help others, can help them create harmony and community and all that other stuff. People remember more when they're happy and comfortable as well. When you are unhappy and uncomfortable, you ain't going to care about much except for getting happy and comfortable. It's hard to focus when you are not happy and comfortable. So that is another aspect we have to consider 
in at-home learning as well as in classrooms or in uh, group rooms or doctor's offices, wherever you're teaching, do are people, you know, happy to be there? And if not, how can we help them get happy about being there? And we're going to talk about some of those some of those in a minute. And are they comfortable? Are they sitting in a chair that they're uncomfortable? I know, you know, a lot of times when, when people go to church and they're sitting in those hard pews and they're crammed in, uh, they have a harder time focusing and paying attention. Uh, so figuring out how to help people be more comfortable. Along with that comfort, and I'll just kind of bring this up now, people who are uh, more high strung, who tend to identify themselves, whether they meet the clinical definition or not, they tend to identify themselves as more ADD, may have difficulty sitting still for an hour or two hours listening to a lecture or a sermon or even watching a movie. So what can they do to be more comfortable? And it's important to recognize, you know, I'm one of those people who can't sit still. I need something to fidget with. And it's helpful for me when I go to, when I watch movies or, or do whatever, to have something to crochet or have something to do with my hands during that period of time. And a lot of times um, I can find things to do that are, um, that stimulate my mind. I taught a seminar in Chicago at the beginning of 2019. And one of the things that I provided for everybody in the seminar at every table, we had a, a coloring pictures for, you know, adult out of adult coloring books and crayons. And I can't say I was surprised. I was pleased, I guess, at how many people actually took advantage of that. You know, it helped them be happier. They weren't occupying their brain. So they were hearing what I was saying, but they were also not feeling frustrated and stuck. Uh, so a lot of people really took advantage of that. Thinking about ways that you can do that in your classroom, in um, your group room can be really, really helpful. They have some research has indicated that if your hands are moving, you know, like when people are sketching or coloring in uh, in particular, uh, it actually helps them open their mind and be more aware. And I'm not exactly sure how that works, but it, it is an interesting concept. That's why when they say when you're brainstorming or when you're trying to um, come up with ideas for something, it's better to kind of make a mind map and keep your pencil going at all times. It encourages that free flow of ideas. So when you're teaching to diverse groups, it's important that you start out with what are we doing? Um, always pre prevent, pre sorry, present an overview with objectives. Even when I was homeschooling my kids, I, one of my favorite lessons that I ever taught my son was uh, Newton's laws. And we started out and we read told him we were going to learn about Newton's laws and physics. And there were three things we were going to learn. And we read a little kid's book about it. And then we talked about why do you care? And so we talked about gravity and how gravity impacts him and why it's interesting to know about gravity. Um, now, obviously, he was in first grade at this point, so we didn't get super in depth. Um, and then presenting the lesson. And when you are teaching online or in person, or you're helping your youth adapt to online learning when they're used to in person, uh, it's important to try to help them do as many of these things as possible. Uh, for teachers, present the material in written form before the lecture. For students, if you've got the textbook, try to read the chapter before the lecture. If you don't have the textbook, but you know in general what you're going to be talking about, then go online and scan it a little bit so you have an idea about what you're talking about. If you're working with somebody who is a top-down learner and they need a kind of a global understanding, ask for at least one question from each student before the lecture, before you even start teaching about it. Ask them, what do you want to know about 
the human body? Or what do you want to know about cells or weather, whatever you're teaching? Provide thinking breaks during the lecture or lesson uh, when it's synchronous. When I used to do psychoeducational groups, uh, it was always important to take breaks every 10 minutes or so to give people a chance, to give them time to sort of reflect and think, how does this apply to me? And what is it exactly that she's saying? The active learners didn't need it. They didn't mind it. But the reflective learners did need that time to be able to process information. If it's an asynchronous class or if it is written material, encouraging people to just, you know, press pause, stop for a minute after each section in order to digest the material. If you're teaching, it's important to call on particular students, not just say, who has a question or does anybody have questions? It's important to call people out by name and say, you know, Sam, what do you think about whatever we're talking about right now? That will keep them a little bit more attentive if they know that there's a chance that they're going to get um, called out. Use interactive technology when possible. You can go online and find interactive stuff for a lot of science-based things as well as, you know, ge well, geology science, uh, for a lot of science-based uh, activities. You can also find some interactive stuff for things like cooking and physical education, but interactive technology using 3Ds, being able to click around can be really helpful for people. I'll see if I can get this to come up. Oh, hey going to work. Maybe. So in this 3D thing, if you're teaching anatomy, you can be asking your class, you know, what is this, whoops, what is this bone? Or you can click on a different thing and call somebody out and ask them what it is in order to get them more engaged so they're actually uh, paying attention to what's going on. My daughter's taking anatomy and physiology right now, and they can't go into the lab, but there are a lot of 3D interactive um, skeletal systems, muscular systems that you can find online or in apps to study or even to teach with. So that can be exceptionally fun. Provide opportunities for kinesthetic learners to manipulate information. People who learn by doing, and most of us can solidify what we're learning if we're auditory or visual, we can uh, solidify it by actually doing it in some way, by manipulating it in some way. So they can research a topic you're talking about and maybe teach a section or do a presentation. They can apply it to situations they know. So give me an example of when this has happened to you. They can write quizzes to test themselves or their friends. They can go on like Quizlet, uh, I think it's quizlet.com, and create flashcard questions and quiz questions that they use, but also, you know, their, their friends and anybody else can log in and use. So that's, you know, doubly beneficial. They can do it. And I told you, how in developmental psych, I used to use that information to try to help me understand what different little kids were doing. And I would take that information and I would apply it as I was interacting outside of the classroom to help me understand a little bit more what was going on. Now, another one is, is laundry. You know, when I was teaching my kids how to do laundry, telling them, you know, what needed to be done. I gave them a, a check sheet of the steps that you needed to take in order to do laundry. And then we went in and we would actually go through doing the laundry. Um, and, you know, I started out by showing them how to do it. And then the next time, the next load, they did it with me observing and they had the checklist. You know, so encouraging people to actually do information because it's a lot of times you don't know what you don't know until you try to do it. One of the things that I found when I did the, the laundry activity was I had failed 
to identify the different cups on the washing machine because, you know, I've been doing it for 40 years. So I know which, where detergent goes and where fabric softener goes and et cetera. So when my son went to do it, you know, I had shown him how to do it. We had gone through the list, but when he went to do it, he was going down the list and he got to that area where he's putting the detergent and stuff in and he didn't remember which cups to put it in. So I wouldn't have known that he didn't know that. And he wouldn't, he didn't know that he didn't really know that until he actually tried to do it. So that's a great way to make sure that you know the intricacies and you know the whole thing, not just little parts. Breakout discussions can be really helpful if you're talking about um, economics, for example. You can have breakout rooms or breakout in, in, in a room, in a real class, you can separate people, have them go to different corners of the room so they're not talking over one another. Um, in e-learning, you can have them go to different breakout rooms and you can give them a topic to discuss that helps them apply the information they've been learning. In asynchronous classes, forum discussion posts can serve a very similar um, function. And gamify. Gamify whenever possible. Uh, Jeopardy, Taboo, Family Feud, Pictionary, Trivial Pursuit. Now, this is a little bit more difficult for um, parents who are trying to help their kids learn, you know, K through 12 stuff. But if you are a Sunday school teacher or a um, health educator or a counselor who is doing psychoed classes or a teacher uh, who is who is te teaching academic stuff, you can make the card sets or the questions for any of these any of these games once and then use them every time you teach. So the first time there's a lot of upfront effort. but after that it becomes a lot easier. Now going back for opportunities for kinesthetic learners, one of the things that you can do throughout the semester is have people um, write the questions for Jeopardy or Taboo or Family Feud based on what you're learning. And that can be a homework assignment that they do. And then you take all of those homework assignments. So basically the class wrote the questions for you. And when you're doing your review for the final or the midterm, you can use all of those questions in the, uh, in the gamification. So that's one way to kind of cheese out and have the students or the clients do the work for you. Um, so that's one of my little secrets, I guess you could say. Um, so it's important to know how you learn. And if you're working with students uh, or people who are learning from you, know how they learn, recognizing that we need to modify things. Auditory learners need to hear it. So how do you hear? Well, you hear from lecture, you hear from recordings, so they can watch a video, listen to a recording, um, even a recording of their own notes. You also hear in discussion. So discussion combines auditory and kinesthetic, which is really super awesome. Visual learners need to be able to see things and read them. So they do better with highlighting. They will do better with textbooks and print material. So it's important to make sure that they have access to some of that and encourage them during a lecture to take notes so they can see what is being said. If you are teaching a, a video lecture like this, you can also uh, give them the option of having it transcribed. There are a lot of services online that do really, is automated transcription, so it's not very perfect, but that will do transcription pretty inexpensively if people want to have your lectures transcribed so they can read them instead of having to only listen to them. Do you all have any questions about different strategies we can use to help people be more effective learners? I'll go back to this first slide. Remember, if you are a reflective learner, there's nothing wrong with that. It just means that you need to take breaks periodically to digest the material and have that aha moment. The, your attention level 
is just as important as how the information is presented. So know what time of day you learn best. Know how long you can focus in a sitting. Try to remove distractions as much as possible. And know how you prefer, whether you prefer to schedule the same time every day that you're going to study, or you just know that you've got to find two hours during the day to do it. You're going to learn better and you're going to commit it more strongly to memory if you relate it to something that you know, and if you're happy and comfortable while you're doing it, and you increase your motivation based on your temperament. So if you are one of those people that's motivated by uh, harmony and feeling and compassion, you know, how can learning this information help you feel better and help you help others feel better or understand one another and promote harmony? If you're dealing with somebody who's more objective and likes to focus on facts, you know, in what ways does, is, uh, learning this information beneficial to you? In what ways is it good to know information? So for example, if you're learning about stock market investing, you know, the thinking person can see that, okay, well, I can increase my, um, my wealth by participating in this. The feeling person may say, I can increase my, my wealth. I can increase my, my financial standing. So I have more time to spend with my family. So see how there's a little bit of difference in there. Tomorrow, we are focusing on the environmental aspects of health and well-being. And if we, if I don't get any other suggestions, I'm probably going to focus on the basics of feng shui. So hopefully that is something you're interested in and I will see you tomorrow. <laughs>